This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. Two sons looking to repair rocky relationships with their dads decide a fishing trip to Mexico would be a great way to bond. But after flying through clear skies, an unexpected storm leaves no choice but to bayde, ditch the bayde, plane bayde. in the sea. Surviving the crash is one thing, staying alive in open water, another. As one son tries to swim to shore for help, the other watches over their fathers as they try to hang on. What it takes to survive on I Shouldn't Be Alive. Mexico's Baja California Peninsula. To the south, the sparkling waters of the Sea of Cortez teem with marine life. There are tuna, marlin, and yellowtail, but it's also home to 130 different species of shark and the highly unpredictable giant Humboldt squid. Jim Hawley and Jens Lundy have been hanging together since high school. He's more like, almost like a brother, you know, somebody I could never get rid of if I wanted to. You know, we'll always be friends. Remember the life jackets? Yeah, I got them. You worry about flying the plane. We've always been really close friends. Here I come. They've asked their dads along for a weekend of serious fishing in Baja. For Jens and his dad, Bill, this is a much needed time together after a long estrangement. I hadn't seen Jens probably in three or four years. We kind of drifted apart for a while. When I called my dad, I don't know that he put as much thought into, I'll get to hang out with my kid. Hi, Dad. And really just have that dad-kid friend relationship that I was looking for. <laughs> but he was real receptive because I had said the magic word fishing. Can I take the rod? Uh, no. Okay. Jim is a licensed pilot. He's hired a small plane to fly them south. One of my first thoughts was how impressed I was with Jim at his meticulous checking of the aircraft. Well, I had no idea that it took so much work to get such a small plane off the ground. Well, you know, at 9,000 feet, you don't want any surprises. I need the life preservers now, Dad, okay? Life, life preservers, all right. You gotta lift that end up a no, bit down. Right. The life jackets that I purchased were um, cheap inshore life jackets. They were $4 a piece, and I thought, Thank well, you. I'll bring these back if we don't use them and get my $16 back. We really didn't have, have much as far as in the way of emergency preparedness. It's the first time that Jim has taken his dad up in a plane. Real smooth takeoff, Jim. Couldn't ask for a finer day, gentlemen. I love flying, and I love the freedom that it gives. I also love the responsibility, and some would call it risk. Jim has been a pilot for three years and has clocked over 200 hours of flying time. In the single-engine Mooney M20, it's a three-and-a-half-hour hop to Loreto, a small port on the Baja California coast. The guy should be fishing by mid-afternoon. Three hours later, the plane is 30 minutes from touchdown, directly over the Sea of Cortez. Hey, look at that cloud! I had kind of a premonition that something was going to go on with this. Something was going to happen. Hey guys, I'm gonna take us through this. We'll make better time. Jim thinks it's just a squall. He doesn't realize that he's flying the Mooney into a severe storm. It was just a real weird mix of 
waking up and trying to figure out what was going on in the plane at that point. It was alarming because it was so sudden. I didn't see any indications that it was that severe until we were in it. The storm is created by warm air from the Sea of Cortez cooling and condensing as it rises over the Baja Peninsula. The resulting turbulence could put a small plane like the Mooney at risk of structural damage. If it gets really bad, it could even rip a wing off. Jim, what's happening? I think it was one of those types of storms that was, it was getting worse by the second. And then it started to get turbulent, and I think I saw a lightning strike or two really close. We're in the storm, and there's no up, there's no down. I looked at everybody else's faces. They kind of had a look of concern, but they're looking at me to see if I have a look of concern. Jim knows the plane can't take much more of this. I'm going to take us up. Thinking fast, he decides to try to get above the storm. Do it! Do it! I'd like to have my stomach back! As soon as we were heading the other direction, the sky got blue, the turbulence stopped, the rain stopped. Everybody okay? I didn't think you felt the bumps at first glance. The four men think they're out of trouble, but they have no idea what's about to hit them. The engine of the plane just quits. It just, it just sort of grenaded. What's happened, son? I don't know. There's a single propeller blade stuck in the vertical position right in front of us. It was like the hand of God reached up and shook the plane. What did you do? I didn't do anything. What? And he kind of gave me the, hang on, let's figure this out. Started? I can't. And that's not something that you want to hear. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Loretta Tower, Mooney, 201, Juliet Mike. This is unreal. This can't be happening. 25 miles northeast, engine failure. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. I couldn't raise anyone. Sorry, guys. We're going in. Without power, the plane is rapidly losing altitude. Jim has just seconds to decide what to do. Hey guys, I'm taking us back into the storm. The headwind will slow us down. By flying directly into the storm, the headwinds wrap around the plane, creating drag. Jim hopes it will give him some control in the final seconds before impact. But it's a risky maneuver. If the airspeed slows too much, the plane will drop out of the sky. When the airplane quits flying, that's bad. That's usually you get severely killed when that happens. I can see the water, and it was ugly. Huge waves. Unlatch the door! With just seconds to go, the men prepare for the inevitable impact. Brace yourselves! I was ready. I had the headrest in my hands. That was the last thing I ever saw. I wanted to see what happened. Are we going to be knocked unconscious and die, or you know, is it just going to be, you know, boom and lights out? A weekend fishing trip to Baja, Mexico, has turned disastrously wrong for old friends Jim, Jens, and their two dads. What's happened, son? Plummeting 3,000 feet. Their small plane has ditched into the Sea of Cortez. I realized that nothing had happened that I was expecting to happen. I was expecting the plane to cartwheel and come apart in pieces. We're alive. A plane was not meant to float. It was gonna sink. I was getting out of the plane. I opened the handle and kicked the door open. 
and I just undid my seatbelt and jumped out. Decided to get the hell out of the aircraft. Jim was still in the pilot seat, and I was reaching in going, come on, come on, come on, come on, get out, get out, get out. It was so stormy. I mean, the wind was blowing so hard. The waves were so big and crashing. It seemed like the sea was going to swallow anything, including us. The airplane began to sit lower and lower into the water within just a few moments. The men have no choice. They grab hold of anything that will keep them afloat and jump into the terrifying seas. back of the airplane, it was hovering, just the tail sticking out of the water. The navigation lights on the plane were still on, and you could see it as it sank and got farther and farther away, and you kept seeing the strobe. You're there with three people, but you felt really alone. For just a soft moment, I thought, my God, how did those people feel when the Titanic went down? You know, you're looking at it, and it's just our little aircraft, but it was the only thing we had. Jim and I were fine in the smaller life jackets, but our dads were not. He couldn't breathe the whole time. He's trying to get his life vest on, and there wasn't anything we could do to help him. Please. Yes. Jens is beginning to regret trying to save a few dollars on inexpensive life jackets. The life jackets that I purchased were approximately for children aged 12 to 15, 100 pounds. Hold on to the chest. Jim's dad, 58-year-old okay. John, is the one who's struggling most. I was able to get my shoulders through the straps of the little life jacket and it kind of ended up being on my back like a backpack. By some miracle, the men survived the ditching. But their fight for life is only just beginning. The Sea of Cortez is over 90,000 square miles of open water with barely any boat traffic. And it's full of dangerous predators like sharks and giant squid. But right now, the men face a more immediate danger. The storm was terrible. The wind was blowing. We were lightning, tons of lightning. And John was really scared of the lightning. The lightning looked like telephone poles and they would hit the water and I was thinking how close does that have to get to us to be a danger to us the men's lives are now at real risk from the huge bolts of lightning each bolt carries up to a hundred million volts and being in the seawater increases the danger the positive ions in the salt actually help the electricity to travel through the water even if a bolt strikes the water several feet away from the men, the shock could kill them. Okay. Jim is getting more anxious about his father's condition. My dad had now become very quiet. He was just sort of staring straight ahead, uh, almost like he's in a daze. It's clear to both Jens and Jim that their fathers won't survive long in the stormy sea. We heard the heavy drum beat, the sound of a helicopter. It was just, uh, it was the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard. Jim's mayday call did get through after all. A helicopter is searching for the men. It sort of just appeared out of the fog, out, out of the storm and the rain, this black square silhouette of a, you know, the big military helicopter. Help! 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 Help!
we have swim fins that were yellow or neon green. Help! That was all we had. Help! And then the noise got quieter and quieter and quieter. Oh, I got caught. Oh. And we realized he didn't see us. He's not coming back. The helicopter crew can't see the men or any plane wreckage. They assume everyone was killed on impact. There won't be another search. How much investment does it take to have some flare guns? You know, you can pull them out, pop, and all of a sudden now, you're an instant target to your would-be rescuer. It was just terribly disappointing because by that time it was now late in the afternoon. The prospects of being out there all night were really frightening. The men begin to weaken as they struggle to keep their heads above the waves. Soon it will be dark. They must face a grim question. Will they still be alive by morning? forced to ditch in the Sea of Cortez has left four men fighting for their lives. As wave after wave rolls over them, they struggle for air. Fifty-eight-year-old John is in the worst trouble. The waves kept crashing over the top and I, I swallowed a lot of salt water and it just made me violently ill. Jeff! Are you okay? I just uh, was totally out of control and I felt in my mind, I'm losing control of the situation. Jim was trying to comfort me. He felt guilty because we were in the water, he felt guilty because I was sick, he felt guilty because he thought maybe I wasn't gonna survive. Salt from the seawater floods John's bloodstream through his stomach lining. The salt concentration in seawater is almost three times higher than the normal level in his blood, making it highly toxic. John's body reacts by vomiting uncontrollably to rid itself of the poison. Stop swallowing, bro. It was frightening. It was very frightening. I didn't want to watch my dad die, especially didn't want to watch him die just because of, you know, you know drowning or asphyxiation right there in front of us and there's nothing we could do about it. Please hold on. Just hold on. If John doesn't stop swallowing seawater, he will rapidly dehydrate. And if it goes on too long, there's a real danger he'll get so sick, he'll die. I was worried about John. I couldn't handle one more thing like watching John die. I didn't want to be there for that. Yeah. Jens and Jim separated from us and said they were going to go look at something for some reason. We need to get help for your dad. I don't think anyone's coming. I'm going to try and make it ashore. My plan at that point was to leave Jim with my dad to care for my dad in case something happened. Okay, let's do it. No, Jim, on my own. And I say, yeah, that's. You're gonna swim by your. You're gonna swim alone. You're just gonna leave us and swim alone. Well, that doesn't make sense. We should swim together. I had already made up my mind at that point that I was leaving. Jim, I need you to stay here. I need you to look after your dad. He's sick, Jim. He might not make it. If he goes, I need you to take care of my dad. I don't want him to be out of go. Look, I need to go get help. I need to go now. Okay. Jens was so insistent, and his logic seemed sound. We'll all make it out of this, I promise. Oh. My concern at that point was that my dad would recognize that I was leaving before I was far enough away. Okay. I don't want my dad coming after me. You stay here until I'm out of sight, and then go back and tell him. Okay. I just remember feeling almost in awe at his bravery. I'm all taken out of this alive. 
I could see him and then I couldn't see him because of the waves and then I could see him and I couldn't see him. They were one wave farther away and then two waves farther away and three and it just kept going until 300 yards away you couldn't see him anymore. Jens is making a guess where the shore is. If he's got it wrong and is swimming further out to sea, Jim knows that he will probably never see his friend again. He finally disappeared from my sight. It was kind of a lonely feeling at that point because I was by myself then too. Jim swims back to break the news to Jens's dad. Where's Jens? He's going for help. Why would you let him go by himself? You shouldn't have let him go by himself. That's my son. And he said that uh, they had decided that somebody needed to go for help. Since Jens is probably the strongest swimmer of all of us, uh, he took the swim fins that, that Jimma had on. When I think back to the decision, was that my dad never saw me as being a strong person, and I was going to show him that I could do this, and he couldn't. It was that. It was that I've grown up, and, and I'm going to show you. The three men know that Jens's decision to swim out alone is their only hope. But this courageous act puts his own life on the line. Jim, John, and Bill are desperately trying to stay afloat, with the storm still raging about them. It's been a couple of hours since Jens left them to swim for help. I was wondering, how far has he made it? How far has he made it? And I remember looking at my watch, you know, and thinking, okay, it's been three hours. And I'm trying to calculate in my head of how much speed he could be making through the water to shore, and just, you know, peering off into the distance. I'm wondering, you know, did he make it there? But Jens is making slow progress through the heavy seas. He has no idea how far away land is and if he'll even make it there alive. His muscles are screaming and he's overcome with exhaustion. I was just done. I didn't feel that I was going to be able to actually make it to shore at that point because I was fighting these waves and just swim uphill and then downhill and uphill. And I started praying out loud and told God that if you can help me in some small way, I can do the rest. Jim's dad, John, is no longer swallowing the seawater that made him so sick. But Jim knows he's badly dehydrated, and with every passing hour, his condition will worsen. I felt very helpless, uh, because there's nothing I could do. I couldn't pick him up, I couldn't hold him, I couldn't uh, drag him off in any direction to safety. There's a feeling of extreme helplessness. Several miles away, an exhausted Jens is battling waves of severe fatigue and hopelessness. And the storm cleared up. And I could see stars. As I was swimming, I thought about what if John didn't make it? There was a shooting star, and you always hear that that's the representative of an angel, and I thought John had died. That was difficult. That was pretty hard. 
Yen's fears spur him on to get to shore to get help. You know what you're made of. I'm not going to let this beat me. Then, suddenly, he realizes he's no longer alone in the water. I felt there were things around me that knew where I was going. The water is alive with small moon jellyfish. There is no way he can avoid the stinging swarm. The membrane-thin tentacles are covered with thousands of cells. When disturbed, they explode, sending poisonous barbed stingers into Jens's skin. The blood vessels dilate, and the venom enters his bloodstream. Blood fluid rises to the surface of the skin, causing agonizing blisters. It felt like when your hand goes to sleep or your foot goes to sleep, just in little spots all over. And they were getting in my shorts, which is not a place you really want jellyfish. The stings from the jellyfish put Jens's body under even more stress. He's now on the edge of total physical collapse. John, Jim, and Bill know that the Sea of Cortez teems with aquatic life, some of it deadly. It's home to a variety of sharks, including the notoriously aggressive blue and white sharks. The men have no idea what lurks beneath them. We didn't talk about what dangers in the water. We were in the water, there was no way to get out of it, so if I began worrying about it or talking about it or creating a situation in my mind, I thought, well, it's not, that's not going to be good. I knew for sure there was something else in the water with us then. Are you okay? I don't know. It, it brought back also to the reality that, hey, so, you know, maybe something is stalking us. It's deep open water out there. Jim knows there are a lot of aggressive predators around here. And one in particular. The squid are very aggressive. And they're very large and they're very capable of killing a person. They are very easily provoked into a frenzy. And if you're in the water during that time, it could be very dangerous. The Mexican fishermen call the jumbo squid Diablos Rojos, red devils. These giant squid grow up to seven feet long and weigh more than a hundred pounds. The squid's powerful tentacles pull the prey into its mouth and tear it to shreds with its razor-sharp beak. Whatever was stalking the men has gone for now. All they can do is pray it won't come back and that they'll survive the night lost at sea. Jens has been swimming for over 12 hours. He's almost no strength left and is close to despair. That's when I started hearing, hearing something. And I couldn't really figure out at first what it was that I was hearing. And would stop and just be as quiet as possible and try to control my breathing and try to slow down my heartbeat so I could hear this noise that was happening every couple seconds. And finally came to the realization that I was hearing waves breaking on something. Thinking he must be close to the shore, Jens heads towards the sound of breakers. And the closer I got, the louder they got and still couldn't really guess or tell what I was swimming towards. Help! 
I smashed my knee on something solid. It cut me right where my knee hit the rock. And then the rock is covered in sea urchin. And they went right through the swim fins, right into the bottoms of my feet. So now I'm kind of bleeding from my knee, bleeding from my feet, standing up on this rock. And that's the first solid piece of ground that I had stood on in over 12 hours. But Jens's relief is short-lived. Then started realizing that if I was on one rock, what I was hearing, the waves breaking up, was more rocks. And that I was headed right into a washing machine full of sharp rocks. Jens hasn't reached land. He's on a reef a long way offshore. In front of him, a whirlpool of treacherous rocks and surf. He has just one terrible option. I knew that I had to swim back the way that I came. It's a devastating blow. Jens is just a hundred yards offshore, but the reef is barring his way. He'll have to head back out to sea and swim around it. I'd survived all the rest of this, and now I was going to drown on this little swim that I needed to do. Out in the open sea, John is still in a bad way. But ironically, it is Jim, the youngest and fittest of them all, who is now in the most danger. Dad, are you cold? No, no, I'm okay. Bill? No, I, I don't think so. Are you, are you all right? I can't stop shivering. Oh, you'll, you'll be fine. Jim is feeling the first effects of hypothermia. Although the sea temperature is around 80 degrees, water depletes body heat 25 times faster than air. As Jim's core temperature drops, his brain sends a message to his muscles. They rapidly contract and relax, making him shiver violently in an effort to produce heat. I had to rest my head on my dad's shoulder because I didn't have anything to support my head, and I began to get kind of fearful. I'm so sorry, Dad. I got us in such a mess. It's not your fault, Jim. You landed the plane. And we're alive. I had way too much to live for, you know? All I wanted was to make sure I got back to my beautiful wife and my child. I could hear my wife's voice of encouragement. Just hang in there. You can get through this. I'm fighting off the cold, I'm fighting off the chills by using more energy to keep myself warm. And I remember thinking, how long can I keep that up? How long until the body finally just gives out? And will I be aware of that happening or will I just all of a sudden, you know, there's a light and there's grandma and Elvis and, you know. It's now over 12 hours since their plane was forced to land in the sea and all three men are beginning to lose hope of surviving. They don't know if they can make it till daylight. Their only chance is Jens making it to shore, but they have no idea if he's still alive. Jens has been swimming for over 12 hours straight and is skirting around a vicious reef. Now, through the dark, he thinks he sees something. As I swam farther and farther south, I saw a light on the beach. It was a Mexican fisherman that had camped out on this beach. I need help. The fishermen need are wary. Help. People coming ashore help. from the Sea of Cortez in the middle of the night are usually drug smugglers. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. No, no hablo espanol. Um, the fisherman spoke no English. I need help. Not enough to communicate what happened and what I needed. They're still out there. 
I was just done. And just started crying. <laughs> Jim's body temperature has dropped further, and all three men are becoming frantic. The only thing that keeps them going is the thought that Jens is bringing help. They have no idea that Jens did reach shore, but has collapsed with exhaustion. Dawn. Exhausted and weak from dehydration, Jim, Bill, and John have survived a night in the open sea. The sun warms them, but it also brings home their bleak situation. As the sun got up higher and higher and we could see better, there was a very ugly reality of really how far offshore we were. They are beginning to suspect the worst, that Jens never made it and no rescuers are coming. They're not looking for us. Jim faces a dilemma. His dad and Bill may not survive an arduous swim, but the longer they wait, the weaker they will get. And predators are still an ever-present fear. He decides they must swim west and hope to hit the Baja coast. I realized by letting go of the ice chest, we could make so much faster time. We could reach shore so much faster. But the older men are fearful. They're thirsty, dehydrated, and very tired from their long ordeal. Dad, Bill, let go of the chest. We can swim much faster without it. Come on. And I remember the look on my dad's face. Once he let go of that ice chest, he had to let go of it mentally as well as physically. And I'm thinking, well, I can make twice the time when we're off that ice chest as I can without it. Bill, let go of the chest. Bill did not want to let go of the ice chest, and it wasn't long before we were uh, 50, maybe 100 feet apart. And it became apparent to Bill that he was a stationary object. But shore is a long way away. After over 18 hours in the sea, the strength of all three men is nearly spent. When morning comes, Jens is led away by the fishermen. He has no idea where they're taking him, but he's given up trying to make himself understood. It was horribly frustrating. There were no words to describe. We need to go back out there and find these other people. They are in danger. As it turns out, the fishermen take him to Loreto, where he pleads with the authorities to send out a search party. All he can do now is hope they find the men in time. The three men have been swimming for hours, and now Jim fears that his dad is forcing his body past its limits. He's worried that the ordeal is pushing him over the edge. I remember my dad behaving odd. My dad wanted to get to shore, die trying. He was focused like a laser beam on getting to shore. I could see something appear on the horizon. Dad, hey, it's a helicopter. It was coming our way, but my dad didn't stop swimming. Help! We were all waving and screaming and hollering and everything in the water. Help! It circled around us. We're here! Help! And then, as soon as it circled around us, it headed off back from the direction in which it came. Help! It's the rescue helicopter from Loretto, but it isn't equipped to pull the men up from the sea. It's a crushing moment. The guys can't understand why it's gone away. While he waits for news, Jens has to make the toughest call of his life to Jim's wife. And he doesn't even know if Jim is dead or alive. Hey, Cheryl, how you doing? She said, I'm, f I'm fine. Things didn't qu quite turn out the way we planned. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, 
We had to ditch the plane in the ocean. And she said, where's Jim? Dad! Dad, stop swimming! Stop! Gotta keep swimming! Dad! Right here! Keep swimming, Dad! Come on! Come on! here! The Mexican Navy, alerted by the helicopter search crew, are on their way. Jens's epic swim has saved the lives of the three men. We could see on the deck of the boat a large party of sailors. And a lot of their missions, all they found was bodies. And some of the young sailors were, were crying. There was a great feeling of relief, but there was also a fearful moment. Even though now we were rescued, the thought recurred to me, what about Jens? There was this crowd mulling around at the dock. And uh, all these people that were there waiting just started clapping. And they all were kind of looking at me, looking in my face. It was kind of a, hey, that's the guy. Up until that point, I didn't realize that I was that guy. I could see Jens walking towards us. There was my buddy. It was a, it was a great moment. It was so great to see him in person, and it's like, thank God, thank you, you know, that you allowed him to survive. And Jim was the first one off the boat, and he just he hugged me. I thought you were dead. There was a huge sense of relief for the both of us to to see each other again. Yes. And uh, my dad came over and hugged me and told me he loved me. And that's the first time my dad had said that in years. At that point, I really felt that he did. I felt that he was proud of me. And I still think of him as a hero. So I want to go fishing. Oh, you bet. <laughs> Whatever. Are you, are you sure you tighten all those screws? <laughs> Despite their ordeal, Jim and his dad went back to Mexico to go fishing. And Jens and his dad stay in touch more than they used to. Jim and Jens still go fishing together, but these days, they always carry the right size life jackets.